the word brand, and it still is misused, is used for logos and colors and typography. That's what people think a brand is because that's what they see. And that's with an identity, visual identity, and the clothes that you wear. All the things underneath that are greater. And that's what got me excited. It was like, well, actually, brand needs a purpose. It needs values. It needs some direction. It needs a vision. It needs to have behaviors. It needs a way of displaying itself to the world. It needs to keep a promise. And then that influences everything. The word brand is everything you do. It's not just a logo. It's a promise that's kept. And that's, that, that's why it's so important to you. Welcome or welcome back to the Bombshell Business Podcast. I'm your host, Amber Hurdle. And today we're going to talk about, you know, my favorite topic on the planet, and that is branding. Because I do believe that branding, when it's just such an essence of, of what you are and who you're about, it's about your identity. And whether we're talking about personal branding or employer branding or business branding, I personally believe that if you are branded authentically and powerfully, that that gives you the confidence you need to be a bombshell, which is why I've focused my vehicle to confidence, which is the outcome in branding. And I say we sell branding, but we deliver confidence. And I think you are going to be like spectacularly impressed with my guest today. His name is David O'Hearns. He is with Don Creative, the founder of Don Creative. And um, and I, I would love to tell you a little bit about him. So David O'Hearns has worked with the creative industry for 25 years. I think he's got some chops. Starting as a graphic designer, following his graduation from Newcastle University, Dave went on to start up his first creative agency in 2006, following multiple successes with the likes of Bentley Motors, you know, my brand, Adidas, and Swiss Foster Care. He founded his second agency, Don Creative, in 2014, and he's here with you and me today to share his genius with us on the show. Welcome to the Bombshell Business Podcast, David. Hello, and thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have this conversation. And, and if it's okay, with, well, let me just, I, I said why I got into branding. And of course, I have a, a deeper story about being a teen mom that kind of forced me into it. Have to understand your value to position yourself. Um, but what is it about branding and not marketing and not, you know, ops or all these other options you could have gone down? Why branding? Well, I look back and think, well, I was, I was good at drawing at school. I got an A in art. I went to art college studied the different forms of art and then graphic design just seemed to sit with me first of all and I thought it was controlled and concise and I, I like that that's a way that I would draw normally and it was commercial I could see a career in that it's more than maybe some of the other arts so I went and studied that further at Newcastle like you just said um, and we do loads of different activities but there'd be the odd exercise which was and this is really basic branding at this point and I've obviously learned it over 25 years but Whenever we did a project where it was like an identity and a logo or some kind of brief around that particular space, it was a bit that got me early on at the age of 20. And I thought, I like that. I can see it around me daily. Um, there's something in it. And so you, you think producing identities from a very basic brief is enough in your early days. And it's like, well, where, where, where do, are you cheap or expensive? Where are you positioned? And there's design tricks to kind of give that essence. Sure. And then, as you start to go into it, you realize that the word brand, and it still is misused, is used for logos and colors and typography. That's what people think a brand is because that's what they see. And that's with an identity, visual identity, and the clothes that you wear. All the things underneath that are greater. Um, and that's what got me excited. It was like, well, actually, brand needs a purpose. It needs values. It needs some direction. It needs a vision. It needs to have behaviors. It needs a way of displaying itself to the world. It needs to keep a promise. That means owners and founders have to control their decision making within what they've agreed they want to be to the world. Um, and then that influences everything. And so that's what got me most excited about it is the fact that this was a business. This is business branding. The word brand is everything you do. It's not just a logo. It's a promise that's kept. And that's, that, that's why it's so important to you. Yeah, I love that. I always say, okay, so you you created a picture to give an idea of what your brand is about. Like, how are you going to protect that idea now? 
And it's like, oh, ho-hum. And I'm like, well, processes and how you hire. And I start asking all these questions. And it's like all the light bulbs start going off that like, oh, you're not just done when you make a logo and you pick your fonts and your colors. Like, that's not even what branding is. Right. <laughs> like, you you write the story and then you illustrate it. You don't create the pictures and then write the story to the pictures. It's just not how it goes. So you say that brand value should be ingrained in everything a business does down to the questions the office receptionist asks vi visitors. Yeah. Tell us more about that. Um, well, it, it's a little story I invented um, to try and get the point across to people as to what brand values actually are and how they should be used. I think too many businesses and big corporates included go through the process of writing values, say they've done the job, stick it on the server or on some frames in a hallway, and, and that's it. No one ever references them, no one actions them, no one changes behavior based on them, no one does any decision making based on them. And most people scoff at them and think they're laughable. So I, I use a really basic example just to get a point across saying, if you've got a reception, a reception desk or something like that, you'll assume that the person you put on it is probably gonna be quite friendly and approachable, yeah? So let's say one of your brand values is really important to you, that your business is friendly and approachable. You've got to make decisions on that. So from a tone of voice perspective, you could say hi rather than welcome. Minor little adjustment, but they make a difference. You could pick colors based on how friendly you want to be. You could have imagery that has two people minimum in a shot because it kind of shows collaboration and friendliness. You could do all of those things. And reception, you'd expect to put a friendly, chatty person on reception. I've been to enough reception desks to know that isn't the case. You can get the grumpiest people in the world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it. You'd think people would do it, but they don't. So let's assume you've gone down the path of putting someone friendly on reception, but then they're off, they're off ill or they're on holiday. You've got to replace them with another team member. Now, they might not be very chatty, so you've broken some consistency there. So I say, well, as a basic rule, whoever's on reception, why don't you tomorrow get an Excel sheet and just put in three questions, say, where have you come from today? What was your journey like? What drink do you want? So as a minimum, whoever's on reception will always ask those three questions. Yes. So there's a friendly aspect to that. Yeah, you, you're kind of part forcing it, but it's quite natural questions. Yeah. And then you can chat around other things after that if you want to, whatever's on Netflix at the moment, you know, that's fine. But that's great. It's a nudge towards that value. And then you might say, actually, did we, did we capture the answers? No. Okay, right. So from tomorrow, can we capture the answers that people say? So next time you go, oh, they came from Manchester. It was raining. No surprise. Um, and I have coffee with milk. You capture that, and then you could say, oh, actually, what we'll do is we'll, we'll create a trigger. So next time that person comes in, six months later, nine months later, whenever they come in, you can say to that person, oh, did you come from Manchester again today? At least it's not raining like last time. Do you want a coffee with milk? Now, you can do, implement that within a day. Yeah. And, and you've nudged your reception desk to, to have a behavior that is pushing a value, and the person that comes in feels, unbelievably special six months later and thinks you've got a genius on reception just by remembering a few key things you're making a brand feel friendly and approachable in that one space now if then someone phones for an inquiry and your sales team aren't briefed on this and they're arrogant and rude you're breaking your promise in that space and you're breaking the brand experience exactly so you've got to think it through in everything that the company does you know the logo, color, type, all of that's a part of it, yeah, and it's big decisions that we make for companies. But it's not the be-all and end-all. We could make someone look brilliant, but if all their behaviors are terrible, they don't pick up the phone, they don't respond to an email for five days, then the clothes they're wearing are pointless, aren't they? Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. It's a pointless exercise. So that's why I tell that receptionist story, because I think it gets the point across of how you can actually use your values daily and nudge your brand in the right direction and get people behind it. Yeah. You know, I, I write about a personal brand in my book and it's my now friend, James. I mean, since that book was written, we've 
became great friends and my kids text message him. That's how close we are now. But, um, you know, I wrote about what made him so distinct as a higher end server and how he was able to build his book of business where he wasn't waiting on random people. Like every night was filled with his friends, but I want to give the example of a different restaurant in Nashville, Jeff Ruby. It's a, it's a five-star restaurant, just opulent antiques everywhere. Just, it looks like a, like an art deco mafia boss owned this place and it's just gorgeous. But what I immediately noticed is when we first started, um, uh, or the first time we had a new server, I actually got a handwritten note in the mail from him. Now, when you're paying this kind of money, wouldn't you expect that kind of a service. I mean, maybe not always, and certainly not in Nashville at the time when this company came in, but it was really nice to open Matthew's note, handwritten note. And yep. he left his cell phone number. If you ever need a table, even if it's last minute, please call me or text me. So I did. Well, we ended up, you know, absolutely having him as a server time over time. And then when he wasn't there for whatever reason, Somebody would come to my table and they, they'd be like, oh, good to see you again, Miss Hurdle. We appreciate your business. I see you have some friends with you today. Is this your first time? You know, he acknowledged them as like my guest. Would you like, you like that smoked old fashioned? Would you like to get started with one of those today? Like he doesn't know he's not, he's not yeah. Matthew, like he, he, but it's in my notes. It's yeah. in my notes. And then one more thing, just so people can like really think about how this drives home. Um, my best friend. And I would often go there before the symphony or or the um, you know Broadway show or whatever, and um, we're fast friends. But that's that's all. And one time they called me to confirm a reservation that I did not have, and I was like, "No, I'm not." And, and she was like, "Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I must have just called the wrong number." And so when she said something else about Mr. Lee, who's my best friend. It it hit me, so I immediately hung up with her, and I called Mark, and I was like, "Do you have a, do you have a, a restaurant reservation tonight at Jeff Ruby's?" He goes, "Yeah, I'm uh, I'm going with whatever mutual friend of ours. We're gonna go see the show." And I was like, "Okay, that's cool." I was like, "I think that they realize that um, I was either not your girlfriend." Or maybe you had another woman in your life or something, but they shut that down with me. They immediately smoothed it over. They confirmed with him, like, but our accounts were connected because we'd both been there. So like to that level of detail, that's a little bit of a convoluted, but when you are dealing with high end and mixed relationships, they went to the extent of connecting my account to his account so they could cross-reference us when we came in because that's the kind of money you spend. That's yeah. the kind of experience you want, right? Yeah, exactly. So if you are spending good money, you'd expect more human interaction, more things document, you know, more discretion, better, better level of service. Yeah. You know? And then I often talk about the, you know, the two different ends of the scale. You know, you've got kind of lower end, lower value um, offers, which are fine because that's what you want to be. That, there's nothing wrong with that. People right. need that. And you've got premium top end offers. Great. Both of them are rubbish at doing the other thing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That, that's the whole point. And there's a distinct good. audience because there's a lot of yeah. people that don't want to shop at Neiman Marcus. A lot of people couldn't care less. It's too bougie for them. They don't want it and they can't understand paying that price. And then there's a lot of people who don't want to go to the discount store. It's fine, but know your market, right? I, How I, do you I, shape your values around your ideal customer? Because I think a lot of times as business owners, we shape our values based on what we want to share and not necessarily on what the experience of our customer needs to be. How would you yeah. recommend <laughs> about that? And, and you could argue that's a tricky thing for people starting up because yeah. they, they don't even have a customer at that point. So they don't definitely know. Um, equally, you can work with a company that's been five, 10 years trading and they've kind of dabbled with values, but have not really implemented them. So that could be up for change at that point. And you can obviously work with bigger brands that have value. So you're not necessarily going to question that too much unless they're doing something fundamentally wrong, but those values already exist. Now, we often encourage people when we're, when we're ex doing exercises around values is to try and come from a point of, <laughs> I use the word hate because it shocks people, but come from a point of like hatred or disgust or frustration or look at those things, either in your own life personally, which is a lot of values, as you just said, founders might uh, put those values into a business because it's what they stand for. And it might not be completely aligned to the offer and the customers and things like that. Equally, you could be leaving an industry that you're in, setting up in the same industry because you think you can do it better. 
Yeah. If you think you can do it better, something must have frustrated you in the last one. Mm -hmm. And if it frustrated you, then there must be some angst or anger there. So again, we tease those situations out to say, what really frustrates you? What really annoys you? Both personally to start with, to get, to get it going, the exercise. And then other things that you've experienced in your industry, if you've been in the industry, and then other things that might happen, restaurants, hotels, other stuff day to day. And we start working on those things to think, well, if they're really important to either a founder or five directors of a business, depending on how old the company is, then they can get on a soapbox about the opposite of that. What is the real positive thing that they can stand for? And then start to shape some of the decisions around the overall offer. So we have a value of true. Say it as it is. If you make a mistake, you just say you've made a mistake and then we can fix the problem and solve it. So we create that type of system in the agency. So we have the freedom. But there was a point when we were working on the values. When we work with some clients really close on a monthly basis, we sometimes have to bring in partners. And most agencies will mark up that partner price by 10, 20% and then charge the client. Right. Now, I don't think that's being particularly true because I'm not being true to my partner that I'm bringing in the service because I'm marking up their price. So I'm inflating the market rate. Then I'm asking the client to pay 20% more on something that they don't know they're paying 20% more on. So I'm being unfair to both of them. So one of our values is true. I don't see the point in marking that up. I will just say, look, we're using this partner. They'll deliver this piece of the work. This is the price. There's their quote. You can pay through us and I'll settle the bill with them. But there's a complete transparency in it. And what I've allowed then is my, my partners will get more success of working with us and our client. Mm -hmm. Client is paying the proper price for something. And the clients say 20% markup, which they may use with us as an agency for other work anyway. So I changed the way that we work or the way some of our industry works based on a value and was brave enough to do it. I, I love that. And I, and I think that's accurate. I mean, when we do that, I, I just say, this is the flow through. This is who we're using. I mean, my agency, we, we definitely work with external vendors. If it's an instance where I sh like, this is what they charge and this is what I'm going to charge to manage it. So you don't have to that out but still transparent because they need to they need to understand like holistically this all works together and if you want to carve out that piece and manage it yourself then fantastic but if you'd prefer me to this yeah. is what i'm going to charge you and you can just write the check all to me and i'll even handle paying them and yeah. everything looping them in meeting it's just, it's just clean isn't it and and the reason the value of true came about is you know you, you could think that no one like dishonesty but clearly people somehow embrace it because there are a lot of dis dishonest people but I can't, I can't even take a white lie from someone that I know. When oh, no. And I, I can't make that because, and you think, just, just tell me why you can't make that like, properly. I don't care. I, I actually more, I want the honest answer rather than some made up answer that I can tell that you're telling a white lie. Is because no my inner condition is yeah. not going to be impacted yeah. by your truth. Like if you don't want to come just because you're tired, then you're tired. Great. I am not going to suffer because you're tired and you don't feel like coming tonight. Like my life will move on. Exactly, exactly. So so I don't like that in life, full stop. So that, that's how we, we try and shape values. But then once you've decided on that value, because it's important to you, it's then starting to think, how can that benefit my customer? Like I've just said about the invoicing and the partner markup and that will benefit the client because I'm just saying, well, that, that's the way it is, you know. Isn't, isn't, I'm not trying to hide anything. Yeah, I love it. I, we do this when we talk about um, the way that we do features and benefits is we actually start with the problem solved. So it's features, benefits, problem solved. So what's the problem it's solved? What is the benefit or what problem are we trying to solve? What feature do we have that solves this problem? What is the benefit of having the feature and solving the problem? And when we can get clear on that, now we're talking about value to the customer and value to our stakeholders. And we're not just like, we got a widget that does this really nifty, neato thing that nobody understands. Like it's it's got to be soul connecting. And, and you've said a few things as well, even when you're referencing the uh, the receptionist scenario, and that's that you have kind of an emotional exchange, an emotional connection. And just for listeners, um, you know, recent statistics show that an emotionally connected customer has a 70% chance of referring business to you. 70% chance. And so if you're leaving your branding to just what your logo looks like, that may or may not emotionally connect with someone based on their preferences. But the experience of your brand, which is what Dave's talking about, 
and having those values that everybody, you know, solves for and, and, and upholds, that's, that's a different thing. Now I've got, I've got a question for you, Dave, in this, we're creating consistency, we're upholding our values. I know in the UK, it's, it's similar to how it is in the United States. And, and there's just, it's a, there's a talent struggle and there has been for some time. And so you can have a brand that you want to uphold, but getting the right people into that brand to uphold those values. How do you suggest people go about that? I think some of that will depend on the business itself and and where you're recruiting and what point within the business. Um, But you should be trying to put a recruitment process in place that is based around your values as well. So I like sports. I know football, as in soccer, Soccer. um, (laughs) maybe isn't as well loved in the US um, as it is at the moment. But there's times, and I'm sure it happens in American football, you might pick someone that's great at playing. But their attitude to the game and the attitude to training is not good enough. Yeah. So they could be the most skilled player, but actually what that will do is ruin the whole team because they'll despise that person and that they get paid the same or more. So just picking people based on skill alone, I don't believe is enough. You know, yes, they need some skill in certain roles, but at the same time, you need attitude, mindset, similar behavioral values. Because you're going to create a better culture and a better spirited team, people that will support each other. Someone drops a bat and they'll pick it up, they'll help them, they won't blame and say, Well, they work in that department and I work in this department, that's not my job. Yeah. Well, when did departments become separate companies? You all work for the one brand. So you should all be working in harmony to try and get somewhere. And I think in other cases, you know, the modern world, digital world, has helped in place in little places. I sometimes use McDonald's as a reference point. Now, McDonald's is you know, one of the best franchise models around. It's consistent. You could have a burger in one country, another country. It'll be the same, delivered in the same time frame, all of that. But a couple of years ago in the UK and for years gone by, you couldn't control the person at the counter swearing in front of you, telling telling someone what they did last night. That That is just what they did. You could, They couldn't control that at that point in time. So even though McDonald's, I'm not expecting loads from it. It's quite cheap food. I'll get it quite fast. I don't really want to hear someone swearing at a counter either. But digital worlds allowed for the screens now to be front of store. So you pick all your food, you get a ticket and a number. So actually the only exchange now is reaching over a cabinet to get a bag. So even though that's not value specific, you are trying to think we're fast food, we're efficient, we want a good customer experience. And one thing you can eliminate is language that you don't want to hear on the counter by making sure all the orders are done up front. And then who's responsible if it's wrong? The person who typed it in. Well, well as You're as eliminating as risk as along the way too. Yeah, so. <laughs> exactly. So I mean, yeah, values are, you know, they need to be documented for all the brand, but recruitment's a big part of it. And I don't think it's taken seriously enough in that space. Um, yeah. My observation recently, I, I've, I've approached one too many counters, whether it's like a clothing retail or an allegedly very friendly grocery store that's known for its friendliness and customer service um, to a bar that typically is a more elevated experience in in a restaurant. And uh, in each of those circumstances, I was not even acknowledged. I wasn't greeted. Like I just started putting my stuff on the on the belt to check out. No one ever said, hello, how are you doing? They just started checking me out as if I was just a robot walking past them. And then the same thing, I put my clothes up on the on the counter at the retail store and it just she just started scanning things. And and I waited intentionally because I'm very extroverted, if you can't tell. And so typically I'd be like, how are you doing today? But it became such a routine that I thought I'm just going to wait to see if the person who works for the company who's about to take my money is going to greet me for being in front of them. No, it's not. And and that's that's a values issue. That is a lack of training on the brand values. Yeah. And and I, I talk about communication a lot, um, both with my team and clients. That we live in a digital world where people might be more dismissive of closing down a conversation. I, I still believe that if you know your final bits of an email exchange and a client says, Oh, can you send those files over? And you do, and they say thank you. I still think that warrants no problem being sent back because it kind of says, yeah, I'm here to support you. You know, now in, in the real world, if that same thing happened, said, okay, pass us those bags and you pass them and someone said, thank you, you'd probably say no problem at the end of it. 
Mm-hmm. So try and encourage that any communication should be delivered as you'd expect it face to face. Sure. And you cl- you naturally close down a conversation, but people need to be acknowledged. And if it's a digital process where there's no humans, like checking into a hotel that might be of uh, more of a budget, mm-hmm. they w- the reason it's cheaper is because maybe there's less people. That's fine because I just want to have a bed for the night. But even in a digital process, you can say, hi, Dave, you know, and you can welcome people through a sure. process di- digitally. And that comes down to tone of voice and language. Well, where's the tone of voice and language come from? From the values that you've documented as your brand. Right. So you can deliver it digitally or in human form. Uh, or even you you gave an example, you know, how does your brand move? And yeah. like if you can expand on that, like when you're putting creative content out, videos, social media, images, memes, like where do you know what is right for your audience and what type of music? And can you walk us through that? Yeah. So music and sound and movement has been around you know since the 1930s as far as tv goes but i think every brand on the planet has only ever looked at people that did tv advertising they're the only ones that can make a brand move and make a sound because this was on tv mm-hmm. yeah, well we're in 2023 now tiktok youtube instagram you know, we can do it on our phone in 30 seconds everywhere there is sound and movement so there's no excuse for any company of any size to consider how their brand moves and makes sound. The problem is it, it's an afterthought in most cases. So you'll still consider my logo, my color, my type, my graphics, my imagery style, my illustration style, all the standard stuff that we'd expect. Movement and sound doesn't get any thought at the start. And I think that's really disappointing because we should be able to say that um, Google would move quite differently to Caterpillar or JCB, which are big construction companies. They should, right. move, they should move differently. They should have a different feel, different vibe to them. And then you could cap, say to yourself, what's the rhythm of the music then? You know, do we have a, a beats per second kind of theme to things? How could we move? Do we glide like a bird or do we walk like an elephant? You know, what, what are the kind of the visuals that we can get? And when sound and movement come together, that's when the magic happens. So in the, again, I always come back to the real world. If I drop a glass, as it hits the floor, we know it's going to make a noise. If it doesn't, it's going to be weird. So if graphics are bouncing on a screen and the noise doesn't hit at the same time the graphic hits the screen, it'll feel out of kilter. Sure. When, when both of them land at the same time, even though most people don't notice it, they notice it without realizing they notice it, suddenly there's harmony in that. And so you've got to think through how you want a sound, how you want to move, and then get all of them to come together like you'd expect it to happen in, in, in the, the real world. And again, you'd base it around values and try and push how can those values influence how we move or make a sound. Because if you want to be you know, uh, a haunted house, clearly you know which path you're going to take for like your noises and your sounds and your visuals. Yeah. If you want to be a care home, you're going to have a very different feeling, aren't you? So, Yeah. It's and not- you you just keep coming back to that word feeling. And I think yeah. that so often in business, we get scared of the words feeling and emotion. And But it's like, you know, being angry is a feeling and being annoyed is a feeling. And that those are perfectly acceptable feelings in business. So like, how can we evoke feeling in the lives of all of our key stakeholders, whether they're prospects or consumers or employees or you know, um, investors or anything like they should feel a certain way about our brand and and how we move about the world certainly is um, indicative of the type of feelings that are evoked from our brand. Yeah. And, and all, all feelings are on the table. It depends what business you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we have a thing over in the UK called Tough Mudder, which is essentially like running 10K through mud fields, rivers and obstacle courses and things like that. That's cool. You, you want an element of disgust and fear yeah so yeah well so you need to betray that because that's what people are after there's no point in hiding it and then people turn up and go what i've got to run through mud and oh no i'll I'll ruin my shoes you've attracted the wrong audience right so so, so you've got to get the people in the right mindset at the start to say yeah that's what i want i want disgust and fear that's what i'm looking for today yes right great brilliant Fill your boots. I don't want to die. I just want to feel like I'm going to die. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) I love it.
Yeah. Full circle. Yeah. Full circle. I'm, what I've what I've gathered from our conversation thus far is that you have to really get clear on your core values, and maybe you understand who your audience is, or maybe you have to envision who you want, who you desire your audience to be. And so you've said like you need to go back to what's frustrated you, what caught, what problem caused you to create this business or to launch this product or wherever you are in in the um, cycle there. And then start thinking about, okay, well, if that's the problem I'm solving, who is it that needs that? And then you start building the values to support that consistently throughout the brand, which means you have to hire right and carry those values through. So they're not just sitting in a drawer or up on a wall. And then from there, that's when you decide, how do we move about the world? What what's the language that we use? What's the cadence of our conversation? What are the, the, your spreadsheet, like the, the processes that we have to connect and take it all the way through operations and then with your visuals and your fonts and everything. And then at that point, do we have a brand that we can continue to nurture and build on or have we missed anything in this conversation? I mean, I think we've covered it a lot in the conversation. Um, For me, it it comes down to what we call a brand's core, which is the words behind the brand. If you haven't documented words and you've not written a purpose as to why you exist, why did you get out of bed in the morning? Why does anyone else in the company get out of bed in the morning? What, what are we ultimately trying to achieve? Your purpose should be written quite blue sky thinking because you, ideally you'll never achieve it. That's the point. You're constantly working towards a purpose because you're fighting against something that other people are doing differently and you don't like that, but you want to kind of get more people on board with your purpose. Then you've got your values that you need to kind of write down and believe in and have a meaning behind them. You need to give people a vision, which is interchangeable, clearly, because visions can can be achieved. Um, And then you go, okay, great, what's our new vision? People would have had a vision for 2020. And then the pandemic, yeah. And then the pandemic hit and their vision completely changed. Well, their purpose probably didn't because they still existed to, to try and achieve what they want to achieve. So you've got to document what you stand for then you've got to take action. And there's like two sides, really. It's like, what do we look like, feel like to the world? How do we communicate with them? And then how do we behave internally? And what operations and processes do we put in place and induction programs and HR and recruitment? Because we need to get that right. Because if we're telling people out here, we, we do this we're really fast and efficient. And then I phone you, no one answers. So yeah. I, email, I email and no one responds for three weeks. Then all I've just told you out here was a lie. Yeah, it's bait and switch. It's catfishing. So, yeah, you, broke, you, you broke your promise. That's so, right. Yeah, you've got to stick to those words. Um, that, that, that's yeah, the, the main thing for me. Is Dave, that's amazing. I, I feel like you've really just kind of covered a lot of different way, ways to um, consider what branding is all about, but in ways that we can wrap our minds around. It's not all heady academic kind of stuff. It's like real world. This is what's happening in our just every single day that we move about the world and how we interact with brands. And so what does your brand um, mean and feel like to other people? Um, Before we go into how we can find you online and connect with you and how people can learn from you, I always like to ask each guest, what is a parting piece of must-have advice that you want to impart on our bombshell listener today, a bold, brave, unwaveringly confident woman in business? So it'll be based on the main topic, but if anyone's listening who's a business owner, director, manager, they're accountable, yeah, in some Mm -hmm. way, shape, or form. If you've got values, then you need to, one, believe in them, know them off the top of your head, behave within them mm. so that other people get influenced by your decision making and realize that this is an important thing that, that they can go away and innovate come back to the table with new ideas based around your value structure if directors founders and managers aren't doing it and they ignore them the whole thing is pointless it's a pointless exercise it becomes an opinion-based business instead of actually a collaborative thought process of how do we become more like ourselves? What would we want to become? So if a director or manager doesn't do it, then give it up. It's pointless. Don't entertain it. If you if you believe in what we're saying today, then write them down if you've never done it. If you've got them, bring them back to life and then think them through on a daily basis. But make sure that you stick to them. You can't go breaking your own value system. And um, just because you can sneak a million pound deal over here somewhere, because people will see it and you'll be found out. Yeah. You, 
you've got to, you've got to make brave decisions within the framework that's been agreed, and that in itself will create a stronger brand that people believe in. Yeah, I love that. So good. That's that is a um, one to jot down in your journal today, bombshell. Um, that that it's just non negotiable. It's that you can't you can't make a business out of um, broken promises. So. Um, I, I hope that you've enjoyed this as much as I have. I mean, obviously, Dave knows exactly what he's talking about. Um, you can get a hold of him on LinkedIn, right? We always want to be on LinkedIn because that's where business is done. So we will put the company LinkedIn profile in the show notes. Um, on Twitter, they are we are Dawn. And then on Instagram is Don underscore creative underscore agency. Again, all of this will be on the show notes. So you just go to amberhurdle.com forward slash podcast with an S podcast, plural, and then look for Dave's episode. And then you have um, a branding newsletter and then branding done webinar series. And so they can sign up for that at uh, doncreative.co.uk. Yeah. And we'll publish it on LinkedIn. We just ran one this morning. So they're, they're, they're a monthly webinar. Um, yeah, if you follow us on LinkedIn, you'll you'll see all of our news and, and content there, definitely. Fantastic. If you are a business owner or if you are anyone who is, um, you know, interested in the growth of your company, you need to understand branding. It underpins everything that business is about. And, and Dave has a monthly webinar that you can just hop in, check in, maybe catch a replay if it doesn't fit your schedule. But I strongly encourage you because his um, philosophies very much align with mine. And if you're listening to the show, that must mean something to you. Um, it's again, can't emphasize enough that your brand is not your logo, your fonts and your colors. It truly are. It's the words behind it. It's the feeling, it's the essence, it's the intention of the experience that that brand wants to deliver to its customers based on its values. And Dave, I can't thank you enough for, for reinforcing those ideas and, and really filling in some color for us today. No, thanks a lot for having us. I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, nice to see how aligned we are as well. So that's yeah, right. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> Well, Bombshell, you know what to do. Share this episode with someone that is maybe they're they're just getting started and they need to understand branding. Maybe they are stuck. They're not gaining the kind of market share that they want to because maybe they're promising the wrong thing to the wrong group or maybe their values are out of sort. And this is such a great episode for Dave's wisdom to be imparted on them. So make sure you share it. And then the other way that you can participate as a bombshell and make sure that the word gets out that all of us who just want to carry forward being bold, brave, and waveringly confident women that we get that straight shooting advice is leave a rating or review. Um, you can also like or subscribe to the YouTube channel. But every time you do that, it just pumps up the algorithm just a little bit and puts more eyeballs on the show. And y'all know I don't do this for payment. I don't do ads. I don't have sponsors. I don't anything like that because this is just my my gift of love to the female business community. And um, and so the more you can help me spread the message, the the bigger the amplification will be, not because of me, but because of our bombshell community. So I appreciate you. I love you. And I will see you on the next episode.